Hey folks and welcome to iWizard. So today we're going to be talking about Ayn Rand's controversial classic, Atlas Shrugged. But first, I have a question for you guys. Who is John Galt? Welcome back, Jordan here. So here we are with trains derailing left and right, mass inflation, strikes, promotion of the most incompetent people to positions of power, banks failing and closing and being bailed out by the government, interest rates being raised, uh, unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats regulating everything under the sun, everyone saddled with debt. The government itself is $31 trillion in debt at this point and climbing. There's looting in the streets. What a perfect time to be reading Atlas Shrugged, which by the way, was originally going to be titled The Strike. That said, let's first do a synopsis. Atlas Shrug tells the story of a group of successful industrialists and entrepreneurs who essentially go on strike and drop out of American society, which has become hostile to free markets and business and is increasingly becoming totalitarian. The setting is in the vaguely near future, but the atmosphere feels timeless. The mood of the story is apocalyptic. The government and nation are sliding toward collectivism. Industrialists are publicly derided as selfish fiends who grow rich off the labor of the people. Washington bureaucrats manipulate industries by fiat and have begun to appropriate the producers' products and profits, always, quote, for the good of the people. As the novel opens, the nation's men of the mind, industrialists, artists, composers, architects, and philosophers have been vanishing slowly for 12 years. Now the pace of their disappearances is picking up. No one knows where they're going or why. They are abandoning their mines, banks, factories, and fields, which can't go on functioning without their leadership and innovation. As a result, economic atavism has taken over, and industrial America is shutting down. The nation is running short of coal, oil, steel, manufactured goods, electricity, and transportation. People seem eerily resigned to the economic collapse. As an expression of hopelessness, people ask one another with a shrug, who is John Galt? Where the question came from and what it means, nobody seems to care. Amid the impending crisis, the tireless heroine Dagny Taggart strives to save her family's railroad company, the New York-based Taggart Transcontinental. She's the vice president of operations while her feckless, dullard brother Jim Taggart is the president. While Dagny stretches the capacity of the train's worn-out diesel engines while keeping thousands of miles of railroad track repaired with pieces of scrap metal, Jim ingratiates himself with a clique of high-powered Washington officials who bestow favors in return. Jim, who wants to be seen as a selfless benefactor to the public, hates and envies his competent younger sister, but secretly depends on her to keep the trains running on time and to generate enough profit so he can keep participating in the aristocracy of pull. Jim and his band of cronies, lobbyists, and bureaucrats spend their days vying for power, privilege, and influence, all in the name of social welfare. Under this banner, and as a diplomatic favor, Jim builds a railroad spur into a barren stretch of the socialist state of Mexico, a move that proves a financial disaster. As a countermeasure, Dagny announces her plans for her own spur line, sardonically named the John Galt Line, to run through the nation's last stronghold of free enterprise, the booming state of Colorado. Raw materials being impossible to come by, she calls on the only person who can help, a tough, self-made steel magnate, Hank Reardon, who's agreed to sell her large quantities of an entirely new type of metal that he brilliantly invented, enabling Dagny to build the track. Reardon Metal is a super hard alloy that the looters and moochers in Washington, Jim's friends, have been trying to impound on behalf of a government-backed steel cartel that hasn't produced anything in years. Against all odds, Dagny and Reardon miraculously complete the John Galt line in record time, hurtling through the Rocky Mountains on the line's first run, with crowds of Coloradoans cheering at each stop. Dagny and Hank realize their admiration for one another has turned to molten desire. 
The Galt Line proves a commercial success, and Dagny and Reardon celebrate with a cross-country road trip. But the national landscape isn't a pleasant sight. It's lapsed into a series of barren farms and desiccated towns, some of which have reverted to barter, recalling Russia in 1920 and 21. The two stop to investigate a ruined factory called the 20th Century Motor Company. Amid the rubble, they find discarded pieces of the prototype of a revolutionary motor designed to convert static electricity into usable power. Dagny is enthralled. This motor could theoretically produce an inexhaustible supply of cheap energy to fuel the next generation of innovation. But who invented it and left it here in pieces? Meanwhile, the looters and moochers in Washington are busy engaging in cronyism and all manner of corruption. They'll use any means necessary to collectivize every industry in America, which they do by serving the cartels and by passing protectionist and restrictionist laws like the Anti-Dog-Eat-Dog -Dog Directive that prohibits, quote, vicious competition. The result is misery and economic collapse, and both Hank and Dagny are hanging on by less than a thread. What follows is a uniquely intricate thriller with a dozen hair-raising, idea-driven subplots radiating from the main storyline, each of which reinforcing its characters and themes. As the great titans of industry, the quote-unquote men of the mind, drop out of the system one by one and the economy begins to slide into a nightmare of Soviet-style collectivism, the novel picks up pace and Dagny and Reardon become the novel's philosophical detectives. Why are all the industrialists disappearing? Where are they going? Who is the copper-haired stranger seen talking solemnly to each of them before they disappear? What does the South American copper mining heir and dapper playboy Francisco Danconia have to do with it all? Is there a way to restart the quote motor of the world? Or will the bad guys win? And perhaps most importantly, who is John Galt? All right, so there you have my mostly non-spoiler synopsis. Now we get to the good part. What did I think of this novel? Well, this is actually a reread for me, though I guess it would be uh, most accurate to say that I've read it about two and a half times. So let's start out by acknowledging this. Atlas Shrugged is an extraordinarily original and very uh, powerful book. Uh, and the first time you read it, it really does hit you in the chest. It feels like a door to another world has been opened and you get the feeling that nothing will ever be the same. It's like a vista uh, has opened before you and suddenly there's all this new possibility and excitement. And I'm not exaggerating here. When I first read the book, I was probably uh, 22 or 23. I'd recently read her dystopian novella, Anthem. I read it one day when I was in court fighting a traffic ticket waiting to go in. And I was blown away by Anthem. Uh, it was so inspiring and I felt like I'd just been hit with a thunderbolt uh, of clarity and purpose. And so then I went straight into Atlas Shrugged without knowing uh, anything else about Ayn Rand's philosophy. And I'll tell you, it blew me away. You open the book and we're in this very kind of pulpy, neo-noir New York City, more like Gotham City. And there's just this dramatic sense uh, of something once great having fallen to a desperate low. People are uninspired and listless and drained of life. There are beggars everywhere. And even the working people uh, who have jobs are like peasants. Uh, and then bam, you meet Dagny Taggart, and she is so different as a character. She's disgusted by the system and the corruption and the sort of zeitgeist of the age uh, that she's living through. So she's really uh, almost an outcast in her culture. And before you know it, you're meeting the heroes of the novel, the few people uh, who are still, like Atlas, uh, holding everything up, even though their backs are breaking. You meet uh, Hank Reardon, and you start to learn that there are others like Dagny. And, uh, and I just have to say that one of the joys of reading Ayn Rand is that she really does create uh, her own completely uh, unique aesthetic and mode of life. It's something like uh, romantic modernism, I guess, uh, with a dash of glitzy sort of art deco. She can make a steel mill or a construction site feel romantic and filled with beauty and possibility, the way she describes a train cutting through a mountain pass or steel being poured or an engine being built. Rand uh, describes skyscrapers like she's writing a love letter. The woman just has a way of making you feel like um, there's nothing better in the world than productive work and achievement and striving for something, uh, building something that is 
um, an expression of your highest values. There's a sort of um, zest for life, I guess, uh, and beauty and thought that just really rubs off on you when you read uh, Ayn Rand and especially Atlas Shrugged. And I think part of the magic too is that the lines here are so clearly drawn. You know who the bad guys are and their ideas are terrible and rotten and they're making the world a demonstrably worse place in the name of social justice and altruism and the quote unquote common good and you know who the heroes are and if only the looters and the moochers would just see reason the world could be so much better. And so I read this book for the first time and I was just so overwhelmed uh, by the book that I actually stopped halfway through, which is like 650 pages in. And I said, this is obviously spectacular. I'm loving it, but I'm not sure I entirely understand all of the philosophy and the economics. Uh, a lot of it at the time was going over my head. So I watched some of her videos and I read a couple of her nonfiction books. I think it was the Romantic Manifesto and Why Businessmen Need Philosophy. And of course, uh, over the next couple of years, I learned more about economics and politics. I was reading uh, Milton Friedman and Thomas Sowell and Mises and uh, John Locke's Second Treatise of Government. And then a couple of years later, I tried Atlas Shrugged again, and it really did uh, work for me. I, I understood the ideas better uh, at this time. And once you understand the ideas, that's when the book stops being just a story and you really begin to understand the author's message. So then let's get into what I liked about Atlas Shrugged and then we'll get into some things that didn't work for me because I'll say that as much as I love this book, I will argue that this is a masterpiece for sure in its own way, uh, but the book does have some sizable flaws in my view. Um, I should say here actually that The Fountainhead is uh, my favorite of Ayn Rand's novels and it's one of my all-time favorite novels. Check out my review of The Fountainhead when you get a chance. Um, although I'll say Atlas Shrugged is of all of her books, the only one that was actually nominated uh, for and almost won the National Book Award. This was back when books written from someone like Ayn Rand's perspective actually could win a major mainstream book awards. These days, if you so much as wear a t-shirt celebrating uh, this book, you're in trouble, as Oscar Isaac found out a couple of years ago. Atlas Shrugged really is written uh, in the manner of a kind of epic, sweeping uh, 19th century novel, um, Ayn Rand called uh, this fictional formula uh, a blend of metaphysics, morality, politics, economics, and sex. So anyways, let's get into now what I liked. Okay, so first of all, I like that there are two or three mysteries at the heart of this story. The first mystery is um, th this question of why the world is coming to a standstill. What is wrecking the economy and can it be saved? Uh, the second mystery is uh, where are all these industrialists and titans of, of industry going? Uh, where are they disappearing to? Um, also, there's a character, a, a mystery character, who is the destroyer, uh, but also the savior who's been coming for the men of the mind and convincing them uh, to, to walk away, to go on strike. Who is this person? Uh, why is he doing what he's doing? Uh, the third mystery is who invented and built this revolutionary motor that uses static electricity? And will this motor be able to power the world and thus save it? Uh, so the story of America's collapse and uh, Dagny trying to hold everything together and the corruption and who will Dagny ultimately fall in love with and uh, there are these heroic characters and these evil ones, all of that is interesting in its own right. Uh, but when you add in this element of mystery and suspense, it really does read like a long drawn out uh, thriller novel. And it's rare to find, uh, I guess, a philosophical novel that is deep, but that is also written like a uh, pulse pounding thriller. One of the interesting things about the story is that Rand has characters that you can recognize, not only recognized from like her time in the 1950s, when you meet these characters, uh, you'll recognize them from your own age. So it's kind of got that timeless uh, quality and, and you'll, you'll meet some of these bad guy characters and you'll say, oh my gosh, this guy's just like so-and-so politician or famous celebrity or public intellectual. So the novel really does have this timeless living quality. Uh, and I like that it's not just uh, businessmen are the heroes and government bureaucrats are the bad guys. Rand gets a lot of criticism about this and I think a lot of it's unfair. There are actually a lot of bad guy businessmen as well. There are the Orrin Boyleses of the world. Many of the bad guys are actually businessmen who destroy their own businesses by using them to promote social justice causes at the expense of 
uh, efficiency. You can think of the modern ESG movement here in corporate finance. Uh, there are corrupt businessmen who get in bed with the government, cronyism. Uh, some of the villains are also scientists and cultural figures and housewives. And I'm, of course, thinking of people like uh, Lillian Reardon here. Um, but it's also a book uh, that's inspiring because it's about the power of idealism. And I love that. Dagny Taggart is the consummate idealist. She has values that she lives. Uh, and it's just extremely powerful to see that in a heroine. Uh, Ayn Rand gives you heroes who stick to their guns and live by their own compass. Uh, I mean, you know, you just meet so many people in life who just have no uh, bedrock ideals or principles. They just believe whatever's trendy or whatever will make them popular with other people who have no ideals, right? Um, there's just a lot of people out there that you meet that like who just seem to kind of lick their finger and stick it up to the wind in whatever way the wind is blowing, that's what they're going to believe in today. Uh, those are the platitudes that are going to spill out of their mouths. And it just seems like for a huge number of people, nothing that they do is connected uh, or aligned with any bedrock principles or axioms. We also live in an age that's obsessed with anti-heroes and morally gray characters who really have no moral absolutes. So that's Part of what's uh, so refreshing about Dagny and Reardon and many of the other uh, noble characters in this book, uh, Ayn Rand herself said that she wanted to, quote, portray Dagny's hunger for her own kind of world. And she said that Dagny works so fiercely because she knows she can have her world only by creating it. And I think that's part of why when you read a chapter of this book and close it, you get up and you feel like becoming something better. You feel like you can accomplish anything and that the world is just waiting for you to shape it, right? Dagny says that she started her life, uh, quote, with a single absolute that the world was mine to shape in the image of my highest values and never to surrender to a lesser standard. And so the message here is really life affirming and really offers a vision of what's possible uh, for human beings at their best. So speaking of uh, those values. I love a story that explores uh, big ideas and philosophy. And let's go through some of those. And by the way, this is a book uh, that deals with economics and politics. There's no way to review a book like this while leaving all of that out. Okay, so I'm not going to self-censor. If you're someone who vehemently disagrees with Ayn Rand, then good. You know, listen to this next section and you'll know a lot more about what she believes. And then you'll be able to marshal your best arguments against her if you disagree. Agree. Uh, if you don't care to do that and you find hearing uh, her ideas to be maddening, uh, you should maybe skip to the what I didn't like section and you can hear some of my criticisms of her writing and her ideas. Um, but, uh, you know, just be aware that, yeah, this is a book about politics and about economics, so I'm going to talk about it, right? There are sometimes people in the comments uh, who say, you know, you have to be entirely neutral. Well, there's no way for me to be neutral and simultaneously review a book, right? It's not about neutrality. It's about me giving you my opinion about the book. So let's get on with it. I'm going to go through what I think are the 10 big ideas uh, in Atlas Shrugged. We are going to start with number one, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. There are so many characters in this book who make uh, bad decisions, especially bad business and economic decisions, because they believe that their goodwill and their uh, benevolent uh, intentions are all that matters. So you get things like the fair share law, which forces companies like Reardon's company to sell an equal amount of Reardon metal to everyone who wants it uh, and is actually being pushed by Reardon's main uh, business competitor, Orrin Boyle. You have uh, other protectionist policies like the anti-dog-eat-dog -dog rule, uh, which protects businessmen from, quote, destructive competition. Um, so uh, there are all these regulations that are constantly being passed in the name of virtue and social justice. So what am I getting at here? My point is that uh, the politicians and government bureaucrats actually think they're helping in a lot of cases by doing this. They think they're ushering in a fairer, more just world, uh, when in reality what's happening with policies like these is that players in the market uh, are just currying favor with politicians to defeat competitors without actually having to do a better job, to produce more value for consumers, to innovate more, uh, because that takes 
hard work. So instead, they gain their results outside the market process through special privileges like subsidies, tax breaks, legal permits, uh, uh, government grants, trade protections, resource privileges, and all other manner of sort of corruption and regulatory schemes that uh, that produce market distortions and and create perverse uh, incentives. Um, and that's the other thing that 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 I want to to mention. And this probably could be uh, its own uh, sub theme, which is that the economy is incredibly interconnected. If you mess with or regulate one area of the economy, it will affect another, uh, and probably in a way that you don't want it to. If uh, you try to help someone over here in this sector, you'll hurt uh, another sector. If you give everyone a subsidy, they get excited. Ooh, a stimulus check, yay, I get to go spend my money. But then it causes inflation, and in the long run, uh, everyone suffers. I mean, and you can bring this back to Atlas Shrugged and think about this too uh, in the context of the John Galt line. At a certain point, uh, the government deems it unfair that the John Galt line can travel at such fast speeds, uh, essentially just demolishing its competition. So the Union of, of Locomotive Engineers, I think it's called, uh, proposes a law that the speed of all trains has to be reduced to 60 miles an hour and that the length of all freight cars has to be reduced to 60 cars. Um, and so think about it this way. The regulation was designed to help rival railroads and enable them to compete, but the regulation just ends up hurting businesses who want to get their goods shipped to them faster, which in turn affects the whole economy. And what you get is these cascading uh, and unanticipated failures, which the government then addresses by using even more regulations, racing to slap another fix uh, onto the last failing solution. Uh, but again, it feels good emotionally to do it. Uh, and you know, even in retrospect, we have this habit of judging our leaders, not by how uh, disastrous their consequences were, but how uh, noble their ideas sound. And I'll quote the uh, great uh, uh, economist Thomas Sowell here when he says, if there's any lesson in the history of ideas, it's that good intentions tell you nothing about the actual consequences, but intellectuals who generate ideas don't have to pay the consequences. In short, the ruling class in Atlas Shrugged, they live in a bubble. They're insulated from the consequences of of their own policies, they don't have to live with them, uh, and they pay no price for being wrong, right? You pass a law uh, that results in a shortage of grapes, don't worry, uh, you've got the power, so even if there's a wine shortage, uh, you won't even notice it because the shortage won't affect you. You've got all the power, you pull the strings, there will always be wine uh, left over for you. Uh, it is the unwashed uh, masses who suffer, uh, the vineyard workers, the bottlers, the factory workers, the bar or restaurant owners. Uh, your wine cellar as an elite won't be affected. And I wanna add uh, one of the other really effective things about this story is that Yes, many of the rulers are naive and out of touch uh, and genuinely think uh, their ideals are uh, noble and that they make the world better, but there are quite a few uh, powerful bad guy characters in this story who are doing it cynically, who know that their policies will backfire uh, and hurt people, and yet who also know exactly how to wrap these ideas in virtue and sell them to other elites, to the media, to people at cocktail parties, uh, and this gets filtered down to the masses. Okay, big idea number two is a related one, and that is incentivize, praise, uh, and reward good work. In Atlas Shrugged, it's not just the disappearance of innovators and wealthy titans of industry that is causing America to come to a grinding halt. It's also the fact that even among the working class, the skilled laborers, the technicians, the trade and craftsmen, the number of truly competent workers is dwindling rapidly. It's virtually impossible to find a reliable, diligent worker with a good head on his shoulders uh, to get a job done. The companies are filled with entitled workers who work uh, really with no urgency, who lack initiative and refuse to make independent decisions, who don't want to take responsibility for anything lest they get blamed, right? Whose first thought is, uh, what am I going to get out of it, right? Uh, workers who start on day one complaining or demanding more privileges and rights and praise and money and reassurance from their uh, bosses. There are just so many scenes uh, where Dagny's uh, just struggling to find one competent person to run a branch line or operate uh, one of her trains or oversee the construction of some railroad bridge. And 
the competent workers are just really not out there. And if they are, they've they've very likely retired to wherever it is all the men of the mind are going. Um, and they're getting picked off one by one by this mysterious destroyer person. But it's not like uh, the novel is just entirely pessimistic about the lack of competence. Um, what you get very often in Atlas Shrugged is also a celebration of competence, even if it's just the competence of uh, a newsstand worker or a janitor. It's like uh, John Galt says in his speech, all work is creative work if done by a thinking mind. There are so many moments in this story where Dagny goes out of her way to reward uh, ability, creativity, hard work. The moment she detects the faintest whiff of competence and disciplined application, she will give that person a raise and more responsibility. And she keeps her eye on them so she can promote them uh, up through the company, even if it's just you know, a mechanic or branch line operator. Uh, she's always looking for, for talent. And the sad thing is that when these competent workers start quitting, she is like willing to travel across the country and get on her knees uh, to get them to stay because she realizes that they're essentially all that's holding her company together. It's like um, it's like this Pareto principle thing where 20%, maybe even less of the best workers are delivering 80% or more of the productive output. And she knows that. And so in many ways, this story is about the centrality of merit and proficiency and pride in a job well done. This story is all also about the dignity of work and having uh, integrity of character. And John Galt even touches on this idea during his very extremely long um, but apt uh, radio uh, broadcast. He says that your moral appraisal is the coin paying men for their virtues or vices. To withhold your contempt for men's vices is an act of moral counterfeiting, and to withhold your admiration for their virtues is an act of moral embezzlement. So we have a duty and a responsibility to both condemn uh, people who are not doing a good job and make that known, but also to praise people who are diligent and competent and creative and talented. I'll give you another example too. There's a character named Hugh Axton, uh, who is one of the leading philosophers in the world. He uh, was head of the philosophy department at the Patrick Henry University. He was the teacher of Francisco Danconia, Ragnar Daniskuld, and other characters. And of course, as the universities become corrupted and decadent uh, and, you know, just corrupted by bad ideas, Axton essentially drops out, uh, quits uh, the life of a professor, and he decides to become one of the strikers. But he doesn't really go where the others go, and I don't want to uh, reveal anything here, but I'll say that uh, he starts a roadside diner in Wyoming, uh, and uh, Dagny visits him, and she has I would describe it as almost a religious experience watching uh, as this once great philosopher, Hugh Axton, is running his diner. She describes the hamburger sandwich uh, that she's eating as she dines there as the best food she's ever tasted. And so she goes there and she offers him a job. And she's shocked when he says, no, I don't want your job. And I just love the conversation that follows. So I'm going to uh, share this with you. She had been carried away by the joy of discovering and rewarding ability. She looked at him silently, shocked. I don't think you understood me, she said. I did. Why should you work like this when you can have a better job? I'm not looking for a better job, he says. You don't want a chance to rise and make money? No. Why do you insist? Because I hate to see ability being wasted, he said slowly, intently. So do I. Something in the way he said it made her feel the bond of some profound emotion which they held in common. It broke the discipline that forbade her ever to call for help. I'm so sick of them. Her voice startled her. It was an involuntary cry. I'm so hungry for any sight of anyone who's able to do whatever it is he's doing. Um, so I love that passage. I love the whole diner scene. Which leads us to numbers three and four, and I'm going to combine these two uh, because they're interrelated. Number three, wealth is a product of the mind. And number four, the labor theory of value is wrong. False. Okay, let's start with number three, and here I'm quoting Atlas Shrugged. Man's mind is the root of all the goods produced and of all the wealth that has ever existed on earth. In other words, this book drives home the fact that wealth is not just a pile of natural resources. 
Uh, natural resources are merely potential wealth, not actual wealth. Oil is not wealth, oil is oil. Without knowing how to extract it, without knowing how to power things with oil once you've extracted it, without being able to uh, put it in cars and planes, without being able to heat homes and make plastics with it, the oil is essentially uh, useless. It's not worth anything to anyone. This is why the economist Julian Simon dubbed the mind the ultimate resource, famously, because only the mind creates all of the other economically valuable inputs that that we call resources. His point is that while it's true that nature created materials like uh, wood and iron ore and petroleum, nature did not transform them into resources. It takes human creativity, intellect, effort uh, to turn raw materials into resources for human use. Iron ore, for example, is just rocks uh, rich in iron oxides, which uh, by themselves are useless. They became useful when human beings figured out how to extract uh, the oxides from the rocks and manufacture them into iron and steel. Which leads us to number four, uh, and that is the labor theory of value is wrong. <laughs> False. Um, this is an old Marxist theory, again, it's completely wrong, that wealth results essentially from labor just applied to raw materials. Uh, to natural resources. And by labor, the Marxists mean physical or manual labor. So the idea is that the economic value of a good or service reflects the physical labor that went into making it. Uh, so this is um, one of the sillier ideas out there. It was pushed by Marx, who I believe originally got it from uh, David Ricardo. But again, the theory is that what makes a good or commodity worth what it's worth, what determines its value, is the average amount of time that laborers need to produce the commodity. And of course, the point for Marxists was to say that when a factory owner or capitalist employs workers and makes a profit, he's stealing the surplus value of the workers. He's exploiting them because the thing is only valuable valuable because of the time and labor uh, the workers put into making it. So the factory uh, owner is making a profit off the backs of these workers. And because the workers don't see uh, the full profits that their efforts made possible, uh, this is uh, ultimately unfair. Okay. So the idea that a thing's value reflects only the labor that went into producing it is fairly easy to debunk, and I'll get into how this idea is uh, illustrated in the book in a second. But first, uh, a little bit of an econ lesson. Whether a diamond was found accidentally or whether it was obtained from a diamond uh, pit with the employment of uh, a thousand days of hard labor is completely irrelevant to its value. If laboring long and hard on something uh, was the determiner of that commodity's value, I could just hire a team of hardworking men tomorrow and we could make uh, mud pies and they would be super valuable, right? Uh, so no, the fact that you worked hard making mud pies doesn't mean anyone is going to want the mud pie. Uh, it's like when a student of mine hands in terrible work and then gets a bad grade and complains, hey, this isn't fair. I worked really hard on that assignment. Uh, it's like, hey kid, I'm sorry, but I don't subscribe to the labor theory of grades. You have to meet certain standards according to my rubric. You can work for months and months on your essay, but if it's incoherent, you're getting a bad grade. So what the labor theory of value fails to take into account is the fact that while yes, you do need skilled and supervisory labor, labor alone isn't enough. You need capital investment like land, uh, buildings. Uh, you need a, a plant and machinery. In other words, you need something for the laborers to labor upon. And who's gonna buy that? Not the workers, right? You, you also need entrepreneurship, which includes invention and innovation and enterprise. So the labor theory of, of value ignores not only capital investment, risk, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, it also ignores consumer desires. Uh, in economics, they call this the subjective uh, theory of value, which means essentially that the value of an object lies in how much people desire or need the object, not by how long it took to make the amount of labor or capital invested or even the, even the inherent qualities of the object. That's the big point. And you know, the labor theory of value also ignores the fact that 
The laborers that you've hired are already being paid an agreed upon market wage for their services. When a worker accepts a job, they do this voluntarily. They sign a contract that says, I agree to do a certain job for a given wage. So the fact that the owner makes a profit off the laborer, um, yeah, that's why the job exists in the first place. You only hire someone if they're going to make you money. For Rand, the mind, uh, human ingenuity, human thought and intelligence, the mind is the primary source of wealth, not brute labor or anything like that. The mind directs uh, not only physical labor, uh, but also the organization of production. And so really it's the mind that generates wealth. And you can see this in the book. Every great producer in Atlas, whether it's Reardon or uh, Dagny or Francisco or Ken Daniger or Ellis Wyatt, um, they're all dedicated first and foremost, to using their minds. Each thinks and plans long range, creates value uh, for humanity. And you can see this at the beginning when Reardon is in his steel mill watching the first order of his new metal being poured. He's standing there thinking about the 10 long years of thought and effort it took him to get to this point, purchasing a bankrupt mill against the advice of all experts, slaving over his invention, building his business from the ground up with all of his knowledge and experience, the hard years working in mines. And here's how Rand characterizes his achievement. 200 tons of metal, which was to be harder than steel, running liquid at a temperature of 4,000 degrees, had the power to annihilate every wall of the structure and every one of the men who worked by the stream. But every inch of its course, every pound of its pressure, and the content of every molecule within it were controlled and made by a conscious intention that had worked upon it for 10 years. So Reardon's mind is the source of his wealth. That's what Rand is getting at. And the labor and materials had to stand idle until his mind showed up for work. And that is one of the key takeaways. In fact, Francisco D'Anconia puts it another way. He says, take a look at an electric generator and dare tell yourself it was created by the muscular effort of unthinking brutes. Try to obtain your food by means of nothing but physical motions, and you'll learn that the mind is the root of all the goods produced and of all the wealth that has ever existed on earth. Although my favorite passage about this uh, is probably the one that the philosopher Hugh Axton uh, delivers to Dagny when he says in the diner, all work is an act of philosophy. And I think this is part of the magic and the romance of Atlas Shrugged. When you're reading this book, you get the sense that everything matters, that every act of life is something you put your values into. From the meals you cook, to how you manage your time or your money, to your relationships, to your work or hobbies or larger goals, you get the sense that if you approach all of these things uh, in the right way, if you use your rational mind, you can do better in all of these spheres and you can um, you can squeeze more out of your life. Uh, what could I be doing better? How could I be more efficient with what I'm doing? What are my methods? How could they be improved? Um, what in my life is holding me back? Um, so really from a janitor to a businessman, you get the sense that everyone can approach their lives in this new way and can invigorate their lives. Okay, so number five, centralized economic planning doesn't work. Uh, so if you haven't studied economics, central planning is a type of top-down, centralized uh, decision-making where the government, rather than the market, decides how society's resources are going to be marshaled, what prices are going to be, uh, what needs to be produced, and for what purposes. So the economy here is essentially run by fiat, by a cast of technical experts, right, a Politburo or some other body, uh, and typically uh, it all of this is directed according to a five-year plan or a four-year plan or a 10-year plan. And the idea is that these experts can run the economy, they can uh, get together and lay out production plans, they can make calculations and use aggregated information to steer the economy in a direction that is going to benefit the people. Uh, it's never worked in the history of humanity uh, and it usually leads to shortages and famine and starvation and brutality, but it seems to be one of those stubborn ideas ideas that will never die. Central planning is very much at the heart of this book and its failure, the government's failure, in other words, to let markets just work, is maybe the chief reason that everything is collapsing. See, in a market economy coordinated by prices, 
there's no one at the top to issue orders to control or coordinate activities throughout the economy. And I think this is part of why you get this stubborn adherence to central planning throughout history, despite its failures, is that people seem to have trouble understanding how an incredibly complex, high-tech economy can operate without any central direction. It's scary and it's just baffling to people that there's this invisible hand uh, that directs the market, right? In fact, um, there's a story, I guess, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the last president of the Soviet Union, I guess he once asked Margaret Thatcher, uh, you know, if there's no one at the top directing everything, how do you see to it that people get food? Uh, and her answer was uh, that she didn't. Um, I don't see to it that people get f food. Prices do that. In fact, uh, the British people were better fed than people in the Soviet Union, even though uh, the British haven't produced enough food to feed themselves uh, in over a century. Prices bring them food from other countries. And this is a point that uh, Mises and Hayek uh, both make, which is that central planning uh, never works because of the impossible informational requirements. No Politburo or committee of apparatchiks has enough knowledge or access to information to run an economy in a top-down fashion from some control room. Central planning abolishes the means of uh, economic calculation. A cadre of technical experts charged with directing the entire economy lacks any non-arbitrary way to decide what to produce, who's to produce it, who is to consume it, and of course, uh, where do you set prices, right? Central planning also requires that all of the disparate fragments of knowledge uh, existing in different minds be brought together in a small group of minds at the top. And this, of course, requires that small group of minds to possess knowledge uh, far in excess of what any one person could ever comprehend. But again, the lesson here, as Thatcher told Gorbachev, is the importance of prices. Many people see prices as just obstacles to getting the things that they want. But that's the wrong way of, of thinking about it. And I like to use the, um, the beachfront homes example that uh, Thomas Sowell gives in Basic Economics. People tend to feel resentful and angry uh, that they'll never be able to afford to live uh, in a beachfront house. The prices are unfair. Someone should lower them. I want to live in a beachfront house. Um, but high prices are not the reason we can't all live in beachfront houses. The inherent reality is that there just aren't enough beachfront homes to go around. And prices simply convey that underlying reality. When many people bid for a relatively few homes, those homes become very expensive because of supply and demand. But it's not the prices that cause the scarcity. There would be the same scarcity under feudalism or socialism or even in a tribal society. If the government today were to come up with a plan for universal access to beachfront homes and put caps on the prices that could be charged for such property, which is what happens in Atlas Shrugged, that wouldn't change the underlying reality of the extremely high ratio of people to beachfront land. Rationing without prices would have to be done by bureaucratic fiat, uh, by political favoritism, by, by even by violence. But the rationing would still have to take place. Even if the government were to decree that beachfront homes were a basic right of all members of society, that would still not change the underlying uh, scarcity of those beachfront properties in the slightest. Uh, and so prices are essentially just messengers conveying the news. Don't blame the messenger. And yes, the chief driver of economic uh, and societal collapse in Atlas Shrugged is precisely this disregard uh, of prices. The government and the people at large in this society are economically illiterate to a staggering degree. And the policies they enforce distort the uh, price mechanisms and create perverse incentives. There's the Railroad Unification Plan, which was Jim Taggart's desperate scheme uh, to mandate that the total profits of all railroad companies be allocated according to the number of miles of track that each owns uh, and maintains instead of according to the amount of service that each supplies. Um, 
There's the Steel Unification Plan, uh, which almost bankrupts Hank Reardon, where all of the steel company's earnings are rewarded according to the number of furnaces that each owns. So because uh, Orrin Boyle at Associated Steel has a bunch of uh, idle furnaces uh, because his business stinks and he's lazy, he gets paid double uh, his actual output, uh, whereas Reardon is paid for less than half of his actual output. Uh, both plans that I just mentioned uh, distort prices and they're examples of running a command style economy. But even worse, they require companies to produce according to each one's ability with the profits being allocated according to each firm's needs. Uh, and this leads me to what I think is the most central an important theme of the book, and that is number six, the Marxist proposition from each according to his ability to each according to his need is wrong. That you are so not, oh God. Mm. False. But anyways, the whole book it, uh, demolishes this paradigm in the most thorough way. So it'll be really impossible to do this justice, but there's a chapter long takedown of this idea uh, when we get to the destruction uh, of the 20th century motor company. The company is being run by the Starnes heirs who basically try to run the company according to this principle. They decide to run the factory according to the principle that we're one big family and the idea is that in this family the work will be done and assigned according to ability and the rewards will be doled out uh, based not on merit but on need. So the employees as a group vote to decide the needs of each worker and to assess uh, each worker's abilities um, and the disaster that follows illustrate that when earnings aren't based on production, incentives diminish, productivity plummets, and bankruptcy is the ultimate failure. Within a year, previously productive employees suddenly uh, develop incapacitating needs. They have crippling accidents. They become alcoholics and give birth to broods of hungry children. And as the needy segment at this company grows, the active workforce shrinks, quality drops off, and customers obviously go elsewhere. Uh, the industrious workers who do their jobs uh, are expected to work long hours for less money. Usually they either hide their ability or quit. Uh, the workers begin spying on one another and pressuring each other not to work hard because that will only raise the expectation bar, uh, but also because uh, people get paid based on what they need, uh, not what they contribute. A system of perverse incentives is created. And after a few short years, the factory has to close. Uh, and as a consequence, so do the businesses that depend on it in the local area, right? In the surrounding community, um, everything collapses as well. Okay, on to number seven, which is that Wealth doesn't just fall from the sky, it has to be created. I don't know if you guys knew this fact or not, but in the year 1820, well over 90% of the world lived in what the World Bank considers to be extreme poverty, uh, which they adjust for inflation and use a, a market basket of goods uh, measure to set. Today, that number has decreased to around 9%, even as the world has increased its population by 7 billion additional people. And all of this uh, came about as a consequence, uh, mostly of the greater adoption of free markets. And I bring this fact up not to wow anybody, but to remind folks that poverty, not wealth, is the default condition of life. As Steven Pinker puts it, in a world governed by entropy and evolution, the streets are not paved with pastry and cooked fish do not land at our feet. But it's easy to forget this truism and think that wealth has always been with us. In other words, the right question to ask is not why is there poverty or why is there inequality or anything like that? But why is there wealth in the first place? And how do we create more of it so that an even greater percentage of the poor can escape from poverty? And again, this is one of the main themes in Atlas Shrugged. How do you get people to understand that wealth has to be created in the first place in order for it to be distributed according to some scheme? If you disincentivize the production of wealth, there will be nothing to distribute. 
if you kneecap the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the wealth creators, you'll have nothing to distribute. Wealth equality means nothing if everyone's equally poor. And I'm reminded here of the famous uh, Margaret Thatcher quote, the trouble with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money. And I know that line is intentionally uh, provocative, but Thatcher's point is that the way to have a more uh, prosperous, flourishing society is to first and foremost, make sure that you've created an environment that is constantly incentivizing the creation of new wealth, an economy that's growing and providing opportunities. Uh, Rand's point is that a handout doesn't create more wealth, it just loots what's already there. And this is something that Francisco Danconia argues in his famous money speech. He says, so you think that money is the root of all evil. Have you ever asked what is the root of money? Money is a tool of exchange, which can't exist unless there are goods produced and men able to produce them. Those pieces of paper are a token of honor, he says, your claim upon the energy of the men who produce. Your wallet is your statement of hope that somewhere in the world around you, there are men who will not default on that moral principle, which is the root of money. Is this what you consider evil? But you say that money is made by the strong at the expense of the weak. What strength do you mean? It is not the strength of guns or muscles. Wealth is the product of man's capacity to think. Money is made, before it can be looted or mooched, made by the effort of every honest man, each to the extent of his ability. An honest man is one who knows that he can't consume more than he has produced. Which leads me to the next theme, which is very much related. Uh, number eight, the economy is not a zero sum game. I'm going to uh, quote Francisco Danconia again, who expresses his admiration for America by saying that the proudest distinction Americans can lay claim to is that we are the people who created the phrase to make money. We don't just think about earning money, but actually making it. So this goes along with our last theme. There is a fallacy in economics called the fixed pie fallacy, though the formal term is uh, the lump fallacy. And it's the belief that the economy uh, is a zero sum game and that wealth is a finite resource like an antelope carcass that has to be divided up in a fashion that means if some people end up with more, other people end up with less. Uh, the lump fallacy, in other words, is the assumption that there's only so much wealth to go around. So if someone becomes wealthy, it must have come at the expense of someone else. And this is such a widespread fallacy. This is how almost everyone you'll meet speaks about the economy. And it's how the bad guys in Atlas Shrugged think about the economy. When Reardon or Ken Daniger or Ellis Wyatt or any of these guys create wealth, the assumption is that it's not fair, that they've stolen it from those, from those other people, which... Uh, is something that you might believe if you see the economy as essentially a giant uh, grab bag of gold. Like the entire American economy is just a treasure chest with some fixed amount of money in it. And then these jerks get rich by shoving other people out of the way and clawing their way violently to that treasure chest and selfishly just taking more out of it uh, than is their fair share. But that is absolutely not how the economy works. Uh, the fixed pie fallacy is wrong. False. Because it ignores the fact of production. The fact that people are always creating new wealth. Uh, and this is why when you hear the term the 1%, the 1% is not a monolithic entity. It is a constantly shifting one. And I looked this up, some 11% of Americans apparently, will join the top 1% for at least one year during their uh, prime working lives because a market economy is not a zero-sum game. It's a positive-sum game. It's not a fixed pie. It's a growing pie. Wealth is created by knowledge, innovation, uh, and cooperative association. I'll give you uh, Steven Pinker's definition because it's fantastic. He says, wealth is created by networks of people who arrange matter into improbable but useful configurations and combine the fruits of their ingenuity and labor. And so one of the lessons Atlas Shrugged drives home is that in a free society that enforces contracts and protects property rights, 
uh, in a free market society, the only way to create wealth is to produce value for other people. The bad guys in Atlas Shrugged, the Jim Taggarts and the Wesley Mouches and the Oren Boyles of the world, their philosophy is that the men of the mind um, owe people things. Uh, they owe random people uh, things simply because those people exist. A free market society, by contrast, says that if you want something, you have to provide value for someone else. You have to help them do something, perform a service for them, make their life better. And then in exchange, they'll make your life better in return, right? We trade value for value, and therefore we respect each other's dignity and humanity. Reardon arranged matter into a novel and useful configuration, and people decided his product was worth more to them than the money that they had in their pocket at the time. And because Reardon could make his metal cheaply and easily and in abundance, whereas his customers could not, uh, his metal was worth less to him than the money in his customer's pocket. Nobody forced Reardon's customers to, to, to fork over their hard-earned cash. Reardon's wealth is a consequence of the voluntary decisions of his thousands of customers who are better off and more wealthy uh, themselves uh, now that they can use his products. And that brings us to number nine, and that is human beings are corrupt and power must be checked and distributed widely. There's a temptation, I think, among well-meaning people when they see disparities in living standards uh, between the rich and the poor. It just begins to feel unfair that some people should have more than others, and you can understand why people would feel tempted to advocate for a more collectivist economic framework. You can see, in other words, how someone might honestly and in good faith believe that a socialist or Marxist approach would be a the most fair or just arrangement uh, that you could have. You can see it in the America of Atlas Shrugged, right? Uh, it's not just these bureaucrats and regulators and corrupt uh, cronyist CEOs who are trying to push these policies. It's not even just the media. People all over the country seem to think that the old system is unfair and they want this magic answer that's going to rid the world entirely of unfairness, of poverty, of inequality. When they they show up to work at some uh, textile mill or at some factory, uh, scrounging and saving, taking the bus to work, barely able to afford health care, while the guy who owns the factory or the higher-ups are living large. They're uh, being driven around by a driver in their fancy car with their summer homes and, and their stock options and the private schools their kids attend while they go to cocktail parties and, and count their fat stacks of money. You can understand why uh, some people would feel a sense of outrage and a kind of irrational uh, blind anger. But the reason why a socialist system, and I mean a true socialist system, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not talking elements of socialism or quote unquote uh, demo uh, democratic socialism or uh, Nordic style free market liberalism with high levels of redistributionism. I'm talking why people would actually support hardcore hammer and sickle type style socialism. The reason why this type of arrangement uh, inherently can't work is the trade-off that has to happen at the heart of it, which is individual liberty in exchange for more power given to the state. While a liberal order is by its very nature one where power is distributed among many competing centers, socialism, by contrast, has to concentrate all power in politicians. And then all we really can do is hope that these politicians and bureaucrats have good intentions, are incorruptible, uh, that they won't succumb to the weaknesses that abound in human nature. Most people probably believe that they would do the right thing if they had the ring of power, but this is almost never the case, regardless of whether the power is concentrated in the hands of capitalists or socialists or anyone else. And by the way, when I say a liberal order, I mean a free market system, mostly laissez-faire, founded on the basis of individual and property rights, uh, the system essentially that Ayn Rand wanted. The genius of a free market system, and Ayn Rand believed this, 
uh, is the embedded assumption that everyone can be corrupted and that power needs to be distributed and dispersed among as many people as possible rather than just transferring uh, that power to a small cadre of elites who say the right things. Uh, who do the trendy thing. And that's what you get with Jim Taggart and his crew, right? They walk around preaching altruism and social justice, the little guy getting his fair share. Meanwhile, they're engaging in every manner of self-dealing, bribery, extortion, patronage, influence peddling, graft, while their policies are driving industry in America into the dirt. Um, and that brings us to a theme I've mentioned um, already, and that is number 10, finally, ideas have consequences. This novel is filled with characters who are not only nihilists and moral relativists, meaning that they don't believe that there are a objectively any good ideas or bad ideas. Everything's just subjective and relative and reality is just an illusion. Uh, so there's no objective truth and everything's socially constructed. And because of that, there's no human nature. So humans are infinitely malleable and we can just remold them according to our will. And since there's no ultimate truth and everything's a narrative, there are really uh, at the base of things, no natural laws. And we don't have to make sure our ideas or axioms correspond with reality. And so there's this disdain among the intellectual classes for the use of reason and for the idea that uh, principles can be grounded in truth or that they even matter. Uh, there are just so many conversations like this at cocktail parties or in boardrooms, but I'll share a couple by way of illustration. At one point, uh, uh, one of these bureaucrats says to Hank Reardon, words are relative, they're only symbols. If we don't use ugly symbols, we won't have any ugliness. Why do you want me to say things one way when I've already said them uh, another? And then he goes on to say, you know, Mr. Reardon, there are no absolute standards. We can't go by rigid principles. We've got to be flexible. We've got to adjust to the reality of the day and act on the expediency of the moment. And you can see that uh, that moral relativism right there. There's another character, Mayor Bascom. He says, uh, what I can't stand is people who talk about principles. No principle filled anybody's milk bottle. The only thing that counts in life is solid material assets. It's no time for theories when everything is falling to pieces around us. Okay, so that is uh, Mayor Bascom uh, right there. And yet I would argue uh, against Mayor Bascom, that when everything is falling apart, uh, when everything is falling to pieces around you, that's exactly the time for theories. It's the perfect time not to discard ideas in general, but to implement better ones. One of the chief themes in this novel is that there are good ideas and bad ideas, and that ideas have consequences, to quote Richard Weaver. There are many philosophers uh, who think that you know first principles and ideological abstractions are useless and you'll hear them say what matters is the real world and you know all theories break down when when people are involved uh, and there's probably something to this but a society uh, at its basis has to have a telos it has to have uh, first principles. Uh, there are ways of running the economy that will destroy it, and there are ways that will generate prosperity for everyone, that will uh, usher in a tide that lifts all boats. We need to have theories, even if those theories are uh, applied imperfectly, like shadows of the true form. There needs to be a there needs to be a realm of the forms, a realm of the ideas. Um, although I, I sh probably shouldn't be quoting Plato because Ayn Rand actually uh, hated uh, Plato. It very much reminds me of that famous uh, Carl Jung quote that people don't have ideas, ideas have people. And that really speaks to the power of ideas to kind of take people over. That in a sense, what we've seen throughout history is that human beings um, march uh, according to the order of these ideas. Ideas program people. And, and Ayn Rand touches on this uh, herself. She says, an abstract theory that has no relation to reality is worse than nonsense. And men who act without relation to principles are worse than animals. All right, so those are some of the major themes. I wanna get back to a few more things I like. Ayn Rand, and I said this in my Fountainhead review, she's excellent at understanding the views of the other side of the aisle. 
Um, as someone who really does take in both sides of the uh, political debate in America and who reads a variety of publications and who has friends really of all philosophical, religious, and, and political persuasions, I'm telling you, Rand really does get the other side, and she's able to construct uh, bad guy characters who reflect different flavors of radical progressive thought, whether the characters are uh, utilitarians or positivists or meliorists or utopians. Some of the characters are materialistic uh, determinists. Some are uh, economic or political levelers. Some are Marxists. Some have the flavor kind of of uh, postmodern deconstructionists. Um, either that or their um, blank slaters. You've got some Platonists. Um, and there are even some whose collectivism manifests as a form of conservatism or religiosity. And, uh, and Rand was not, despite what many people think, she was not a conservative either. Uh, that said, all of these uh, bad guys have a few, I would say, strains of, of thought in common. Um, all of Ayn Rand's bad guys either advocate collectivism, deny human nature, deny the centrality of reason, uh, are epistemological pessimists, um, uh, are nihilists, or believe in the necessity of, of self-sacrifice, which is a problem for Rand. And, and Rand is really, I found that Rand is really good at embodying those beliefs uh, in her different characters. And I would say too that, that uh, she understands the power of the media and the importance of having the media in your pocket in order to attain uh, and keep political power. That's something that you get a lot in the Fountainhead uh, and it's no different uh, uh, here. And lastly, I've got to give some love to Galtz Gulch, uh, AKA Atlantis. Those chapters for my money uh, are, are some of the best and most fascinating parts of this novel because you spend so long waiting for this to happen and when it's revealed, it really is satisfying. Um, I can't say much more about this, but I'll just say that uh, while there are elements of dystopia, certainly, in this novel, there are elements of utopia as well. All right, now it's time to get into what I disliked, okay? Uh, and keep in mind, I love this book, but I do think it has some flaws. First of all, this book is actually overly long. Again, as a lover of big books, I like big books and I cannot lie. Still, this novel is about 200 pages too long and it's mostly the middle of the book. Pages 450 to say maybe 650 or 625, uh, a lot of that could be completely cut out. And then maybe about half of the John Galt speech, even though I really enjoyed uh, the John Galt speech, uh, and uh, maybe trim some of the other speeches as well. If you do that, you've got a book that is still a masterpiece in terms of the content uh, and the substance, but it's going to read more like a novel. Honestly, um, from reading her biography, I really do think it was um, that her editors were afraid of her. Um, Ayn Rand was a very intransigent woman, and she really had a hard time uh, listening to the aesthetic critiques of, of others and letting go, killing her babies, uh, as Stephen King would put it. Second of all, I'm just going to say it uh, bluntly, the characters need to be more human. They need to act remotely like actual people and less like comic book characters. And I understand that uh, this book is an allegory. It's a philosophical epic of good and evil. And really, the ideas are are what count, right, in this kind of novel. Um, but in a lot of cases, the characters, uh, I guess, lack a certain inner conflict, a certain... Um, a certain psychomachia, and as a consequence, sometimes they do feel rather inhuman. I think to add to that, it's partly because Rian tries to give the characters a, a physical appearance that mirrors their personality, that, um, that says something about their virtues or lack thereof, right? And another problem that divorces uh, this book from reality is that the heroes in Ayn Rand novels are all... Uh, chisel jawed. They're either lean or muscular. They all sort of have an angular quality about them. The men are typically described as 
uh, not as attractive, but as having a hard, unyielding, uh, chiseled uh, quality, sharp lines, square-jawed, intransigent, uh, like sculptures chiseled out of marble. She describes one guy as being cut of steel, as being a single hole, an abstract axiom, a sculpture reduced to a single form, an irreducible absolute. Uh, the women in her books are kind of the same, uh, but they're allowed to have nice legs and slightly softer features. And of course, all of the bad guys too are these loose-skinned, frumpy, stooped and hunched over, uh, fat people with beady eyes. Um, they're, at one point she calls them, uh, quote, men with gelatin eyes, rubber voices, spiral-shaped convictions, um, non-committal souls, and non-committing hands. It's like, come on, I get that this is literature. Uh, many writers do this, I know, uh, from Charles Dickens to J.K. Rowling, but at a certain point uh, in Atlas Shrugged, the characters began to feel like like caricatures. None of her characters are seem real to me. The good guys have unyielding kind of um, German names like Rourke and Galt, uh, and the bad guys have names like Mooch and Boyle, right? Um, but again, let, let's give uh, Ayn Rand her due. Uh, her take on this was, look, I'm not trying to create characters that are real. Uh, she said, and I quote, I'm interested in men only as they reflect philosophical principles. And she goes on to say, I decided to become a writer not in order to save the world, uh, nor to serve my fellow men, but for the simple, personal, selfish, egotistical happiness of creating the kind of men and events I could like, respect, and admire. I can bear to look around me levelly. I cannot bear to look down. I wanted to look up. Which is fine, right? Uh, it's just that the result oftentimes is that so many of the characters have a personality and a worldview uh, that is identical uh, to uh, Ayn Rand. We're talking uh, in this novel, Hank Reardon, Dagny Taggart, Ragnar Daniskjold, John Galt, Eddie Willers, William Hastings, Hugh Axton, Quentin Daniels. There's even a random homeless guy on a train uh, there are others, too. They all speak like her. They make the same arguments that Ayn Rand would make. They're extremely intense like her. Uh, they're, like, they're like objectivism bots programmed to utter algorithmically the premises of her philosophy uh, when stimulated to do so. Uh, and I literally said this to my wife when I was about halfway through this book. I said to her, the only way that this actually makes sense, the fact that so many people literally in this world have Rand's exact same philosophy, is if there's actually some influential philosopher in the world of this story who all of these characters are uh, like devoted adherents of, right? Because when you meet people in the real world, they just aren't the same like that. They don't all share the same sort of niche um, kind of eccentric, rigid philosophy. Um, and I, I, I'm kind of exaggerating, but again, you want your characters to not just be mouthpieces of your ideology. You want them to be um, whole, idiosyncratic individuals who are each different from one another, right? So, you know, there are elements of that that also I think can work as well, that I like as well. The heroes are heroes, in in this novel and Ayn Rand does not feel the need to create this this morally gray world uh, and that can be refreshing honestly the heroes don't all need to be anti-heroes and you do see this nowadays is that every show and these are shows I love whether it's um, Succession or White Lotus or Enlightened or Game of Thrones all of the characters are in these uh, modern shows are super morally gray. Uh, there are no heroes. The moment we're given a glimmer of hope that there might like be a good guy in one of these shows, like Eddard Stark, he gets his head cut off. Everything cynical and Machiavellian, honor, chivalry, virtue, all of those virtues are dead. Um, and the characters are essentially poor players who strut and fret their hour upon the stage and are heard no more. And then everything signifies nothing in the end. And this is decidedly not the case with Ayn Rand. Um, but I will say, I think that there is something sacrificed. There is something that is lost uh, with the way that she writes 
her novels, and that is a certain realism, a certain uh, verisimilitude, which is fine. As Thomas Sowell says, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. So you do get real heroes, uh, and you get a, a world where there's hope and moral goodness and moral absolutes, uh, but there are trade-offs, and, and, and you lose a certain realism there. And again, I'm going to apply a couple of John Updike's uh, famous maxims for, for literary criticism, one of which is to try to understand what the author wished to do and don't blame him for not achieving what he did not attempt. Uh, and um, also, I love this one as well, uh, submit to whatever spell weak or strong is being cast. And so despite my criticism, I do believe that if we're going to commit to reading a book, we should always try to submit to the spell the author is weaving, even if at the end of the day, we have some criticisms. And speaking of that, here's another one that has to do with the characters. Again, while I enjoyed the philosophical aspects of this novel, I did find it annoying that the characters are constantly speaking to each other in the form of long, impassioned speeches, truly interminable levels of speechifying that should really be cut down or, I guess, reserved for the climax of a story. But I'm telling you, they're constant in this book. Uh, it's just so many pages of Ayn Rand lecturing us. She loves the whole uh, courtroom speech trope, right? Make the character a victim of society's persecution, place him in a courtroom and allow him to make a 10 page long speech without being interrupted by a judge or any of the lawyers. And my God, in this novel, there is one speech and I'm referring obviously to the notorious uh, radio broadcast speech by John Galt uh, that is essentially the climax of the novel. And this dang thing is like over 60 pages long and is like three hours long uh, on audiobook. And again, not to not to be cliche, but I do really believe in the show don't tell rule. Uh, if you want your novel to be philosophical fiction, uh, try to do it in a more elegant way. And the thing is, Rand can do it. She did it in The Fountainhead, but for some reason uh, in this book, she chose to have the characters all speak like obnoxious professors at an Oxford style debate. And it's even more obnoxious when the subject matter has anything to do with romance or sex, um, because it's funny, there's long been a criticism uh, in the literary world that men can't write good sex scenes, right? Uh, and I think that's valid. Um, you know, uh, they're either overly romanticized uh, when men write sex scenes or they're disgusting and degrading or immature. I'm going to tell you right now that Ayn Rand, she can't really write a sex scene either, uh, but she's got a different problem. No matter whose perspective it's from, she feels the need to fill that person's mind with some deep philosophical discourse on the nature of eros uh, and desire and how the sex act is a manifestation of a people's highest values uh, that they express in and through the sex act. And it's just so intense and cringy at times. Every character has the same uh, giddy, romantically didactic intensity. So when the characters aren't raping or dominating each other, they're acting like the characters in a soap opera would act if they all had PhDs in philosophy. She's also weirdly obsessed with this idea of having two lovers attempting to destroy one another for reasons that actually have more to do with love and respect in The Fountainhead that's obviously uh, Rourke and Dominique. Uh, in Atlas, it's uh, Francisco trying to destroy Dagny. Anyways, I promise I'm not a prude or anything like that, but it just feels like Rand is kind of cringy uh, when it comes to romance uh, at times. Uh, again, it's better in the fountainhead, but um, it's just kind of how I feel, guys. It's just kind of how I feel. All right, and this is where we get to Ayn Rand's philosophy and my criticism of the kind of world that her philosophy would imply. And I would say that this is probably my biggest criticism of Rand's worldview and of this novel. And remember, I love Ayn Rand. She's one of my heroes. I'm with her like 80% uh, when it comes to her philosophy, but there are some places where I do veer in a different direction. I'm with Rand when it comes to her understanding 
of how all the interconnected elements of an industrial economy fit together. She's a very gifted observer uh, when it comes to that. She was able to describe these things so well, of course, because she'd uh, seen what an economy looked like while it was being wrecked from the Soviet Union. And you can tell that Rand's writing is dominated by the fact that she lived through the the birth pangs of Soviet Russia and saw her family's business destroyed by Lenin's vile ideology and uh, the Soviet Union's extraordinarily uh, incompetent uh, economic management. But I do feel that Rand uh, does not quite get, in some cases, how human beings work. And I believe that there are some aspects of her philosophy that just cannot work in practice if, if by work we mean generate a framework by which uh, a person or a society can order itself. At the heart of Rand's philosophy is a kind of radical, extreme, anti-altruistic libertarian individualism, and I sympathize with those ideas. But if I've learned anything uh, over the years from my study of politics and history and society, it is that that kind of approach to the ordering of society can turn in on itself and devour itself uh, from within. In other words, Rand's philosophy has, in my view, some internal contradictions that cause it to collapse, not in theory, but actually in practice. Rand's philosophy is one that is based on a kind of radical atomized individualism. Everything is then built around that. You strip society essentially down to a set of separate, discrete, atomized individuals in a state of nature, and then you extrapolate uh, Lockean rights from that and build a society on top of that, uh, of those natural uh, negative rights. And what you end up with is a value neutral public square, uh, classical liberalism, legal proceduralism, and a culture of rights, uh, which then leads to a culture of libertinism, which then leads to a culture, I would argue, of entitlements. Rand really believed that making the individual the fundamental organizing unit of society was a way to resist government dependency and keep citizens uh, from government interference in their lives. And you can see why she took this extreme approach, escaping from the Soviet Union. And yet one of the problems with this is that when you see society not as networks of uh, little platoons, as Burke called them, or overlapping institutions, or nested structures organized according to principles of subsidiarity. When you fail to see that individuals are produced, uh, molded, and shaped by families, and that actually the family is the fundamental unit of society, instead you end up with a population of atomized, radically individuated selves who are so alone and unmoored and adrift that they end up needing and turning to central governments uh, for support and assistance. So what I'm saying is that the individualism of Rand's philosophy can paradoxically um, usher in collectivism and a uh, populist politics. And again, Rand just doesn't seem to get that the characters in her novel are not real. Uh, we as human beings are not radically individuated selves. We're social animals who are often blind to just how social we actually are and, and need to be. Notice that there are no children in Ayn Rand's novels. Nothing binding or limiting individuals exists in her novels. None of the main characters have any of the hang-ups or dependencies or weaknesses that most people in society have. The characters aren't thinking about death, they're not alcoholics, they're not caring for sick uh, parents or raising two kids, they don't have cancer, they don't volunteer at the soup kitchen, right? In Ayn Rand's ideal world, who exactly would volunteer at the soup kitchen? Who would work at those um, hospices as volunteers, nursing people as they die, as they lay dying in your arms? Um, none of the characters in Ayn Rand's novels were raised religious. They don't have to go to their cousin's baby shower. They don't have to put their dog to sleep or to save their brother from his heroin addiction. They don't have to take time out of their corporate crusades to bury their father right after they've lost him when no one else will do it. They're all 
healthy, attractive, chisel-jawed zealots who put in 80 billable hours a week and drink cocktails and have sex fests every night. And as inspiring as it is to read her novels, the world will never be like this. Not everyone has a mobile soul and a kind of on-the-go portable identity like the Dagny Taggarts and Howard Rourkes of the world. Not everyone has the knowledge and the, and the skills to survive some of the more brutal elements of this kind of extreme uh, capitalism, right? The incessant uh, mutations and upheavals, what Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction, um, that you get with an with a, an increasingly globalized capitalism, right? When you look at some of these um, some of these Rust Belt towns in America, and the fact that a factory will just close because of outsourcing or uh, automation, and everyone in that community is left without a job, Ayn Rand doesn't have a solution for that, right? Um, and I'm saying this as as a capitalist. Um, in other words, to use uh, David Goodhart's terminology, most people are somewhere people. Ayn Rand's characters are anywhere people. They eat on the go. They have no friends. They work all the time. They live out of hotel rooms. They don't value home, stability, tradition, generational continuity like most people do. Nor are, nor are most people so intransigent or so you know, brilliantly autistically focused as the heroes are in Ayn Rand's novels. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, this is a masterpiece. Even if it's a flawed masterpiece, don't let my criticism get you down. This book is well worth the reading. It is so well worth the reading that I've read this novel two and a half times. I love it. Uh, and uh, if you're like me and you come away agreeing with 80% of what she says, that is a heck of a lot more uh, than most people. So I just want to say this is a truly a great book. It's a classic. It's a masterpiece for a reason. Please subscribe on um, YouTube. Uh, follow us on Facebook on Goodreads. And uh, until next time, happy reading. Mm -hmm.